pretty much I've got the uh, APV out on my neighbors. <laughs> like I'm sure there's a bunch of empty ones on our streets. Seriously. I'm sure actually, and I think that may be actually why it was missed just because everybody else, you know, there's really no one else in our street that's in town at the moment on our side. So maybe when they zipped through there, they didn't see it or I don't they know. They didn't zip so. through our side because it is a mountain of snow. I mean, mountains of snow. <laughs> I don't know how it even got down there. All right. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Hey, hi, Cassandra. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Sorry, hey. I was I was on another Zoom call and I was running the. I, I seem to be continually running a couple minutes behind schedule. I just keep yeah. jumping like from from meeting to meeting. So uh, I apologize. But, no, it's all good. I was I had a momentary panic because I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe I didn't get her the right connection, and maybe she's lost out there in Zoom land. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's so always a possibility. Yeah, very good. Well, we have an agenda, but I'm going to kind of set it aside because I know your time is valuable. Um, this is our recycling crew. Uh, we're missing a few folks and they might pop in here in a, in a bit. So I'll pay attention to see if anybody else wants to join. Uh, but this is our crew that's really been kind of uh, working fast and furious, if you will, for the last two years, just about on recycling in our tri-community area. Um, and what I might do is just have them go around and introduce themselves and say where which which municipality they are representing, um, and then we'll turn it over to you. How's that? All right, so I'm going to go from the top. I see Kathy. Um, Kathy North, City of Douglas. I see Demetria. Hi, Cassandra. I'm Demetria. I'm from the City of Douglas. All right, I see Daniel. I am Daniel DeFranco, uh, Sagatech Township. Kelly. Hi, Kelly Roach, City of Sagatech. Patrick. Patrick Stewart, uh, Township. Okay, Rana. Rana Alexander and uh, City of Douglas. All right, and Linda. Oh, you're muted, hon. Here, let me see if I can help you out here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sure can. Okay, my name is Linda. I'm from the city of Sagatech. And Arn, you're little. And I see Dimitri and I see Rana. I think I see Bronco Road. <laughs> okay, very good. Reminds it proper. Very good. All right, and then I see Jim Yost. Hey, Jim Yost. Um, I'm in Holland. I help out just here and there with what I can. So Jim is our composting guy. He's never really officially been a member of the committee, but we've just made him an honorary one because he teaches us everything we need to know about composting. <laughs> and so, so, all right, very good. Um, so this is the first time we've really kind of met since before the holidays. So we were all catching up. Kathy's in Florida. I have no idea where Patrick is on a boat. Um, Kelly's in Utah skiing. So we're just all over the United States. Um, but with that, we've been looking forward to this for several months now. Um, I saw some notes come across on my um, email yesterday as far as municipal recording practices that have been updated. And I'll be honest to say, I just took a quick glance and that's all I know. Um, uh, I believe Daniel was with me on the onboarding that you did for all the recipients. So he's mm -hmm. he has a as much of an understanding about this as I do. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you introduce yourself and then go from there. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. So um, I'm Cassandra Ford. Um, I am a community project manager with the Recycling Partnership. So um, I am in leading this meeting and, and going through this onboarding with you, but actually for the implementation of your project, you're actually going to be working with another teammate um, her name is Amina Robinson. Um, she's only with us on Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. She's working on our multifamily projects in Atlanta. So she's only doing the Michigan projects on the other three days. So unfortunately, she could not be here today um, for this meeting, but um, you will see communication start to come through from her and she'll be leading the majority of your meetings as we move forward into the process. But, um, but for today, I'm going to You've got me, um, so I can kind of you know, walk you through it, and we can start talking about some of the, the specifics. Um, I've been with a partnership for a couple of years now. Um, before that, I spent 
um, four years um, running the recycling programs for the city of Kansas City, um, Missouri. And then I also spent eight years running um, recycling programs for the city of Lawrence, Kansas, which is where um, my alma mater, the University of Kansas is, um, including the composting programs that we that we ran there. So uh, I've got a lot of experience in the nonprofit as well as the um, public um, municipality side of, of implementing these types of programs. So I am happy to, um, to be here. I'm going to provide technical assistance along the way. Um, I led the majority of the Michigan projects last phase. So over 2020 and 2021, um, we imp implemented um, these types of programs in, I think, 14 um, programs. Well, 14 programs. I think there was about 100 communities that were represented within that um, in Michigan last year. So, um, and we're kind of wrapping those up. And then you all are one of the grantees for phase two. So, and we do have um, 13 grantees moving forward in phase two, um, yourselves along with the 12 others. And uh, we also do have authorization to proceed with the phase three. So we are um, you know, gonna keep this party train rolling um, into next year as well. So um, real quick, for those of you who weren't on the meeting, um, just a real quick um, recap of kind of what the program is. Um, it's what we call a quality improvement program. Um, you may also hear us refer to it as an optimization program. Um, what that means essentially in a nutshell is that we are looking at reducing contamination in recycling. So for your old programs, you know, being a curbside program, we're looking at what we traditionally call our feet on the street program, which means we're putting um, taggers out onto the street um, on your collection days to look into carts or look into collection bins, um, spot contamination and tag accordingly. Um, so this is, you know, an educational component. It's also a behavior change program is what we're looking for um, with the ultimate goals of reducing contamination in your recycling stream, uh, increasing participation in your recycling program, and um, an overall increasing the quality and the tonnage um, that your recycling brings in, um, into back into the, you know, uh, the circular economy. So that's kind of the overall goals, big picture. Um, the, the milestones within the program are, um, you know, we're going to set this project up, figure out kind of like what your basic timeline looks like. Um, we're going to um, design and mail out an informational mailer. Um, so what usually we call it an info card. It's usually a postcard that gets mailed out to all the residences. Um, it's going to say what can and can't go into your recycling bin. Um, give all the pertinent information. Um, to the residents, make sure that they know what can and can't go um, in the program. Um, that goes out first. Then we typically implement the program, which is putting taggers out into the street. Um, we normally say four collection cycles. So I know your collection, your curbside collection is a little bit different than some. So that's going to be part of the conversation today. Um, so four collection cycles is our goal. And then um, during that process, or kind of like towards the end of that process of the tagging, we, um, we send out a second mailer that is um, typically what we call the top issue mailer. So it's what the biggest issue is that we found, um, whether or not we found that during the tagging process or whether or not we found it during like maybe a pre-audit of your material going into the MRF, you know, whatever the biggest issue is that we found in your specific recycling, that's what we're going to focus on. Um, that's going to be a secondary mailer. Again, it mails out to everybody on the household, all the households, and um, to really, you know, reinforce that behavior change, reinforce that like this is the biggest issue for your communities. Um, and then, um, and then we kind of wrap up tagging, wrap up the program. Um, if we're doing audits, you know, before and after, we'll do a post audit um, to get kind of like the final contamination number, um, and then that's it. So typically the program, you know, implementation, it can take, you know, six months usually with, again, with your collection process, it might take a little bit longer, um, but that's kind of what part of the discussion is, is figuring out today kind of what your timeline is going to look like. Um, but that's, that's the gist of it. That's a real big picture, you know, the milestones we're looking at. Um, as a project manager, myself or Amina, you know, we have the, um, you know, the basic construct or what that info card is going to look like. We'll use, you know, your specific information, your logos and whatnot, you know, to make sure that that gets detailed and specific to your communities. But we know based on the behavior change research we've done, we know what works, you know, what messages to give to people, how to give that message um, to be the most effective that we can.
So that's kind of real big picture. Um, today we're going to talk about you know some of those details that will change our timeline a little bit. Um, so quick questions, any questions about kind of like overall general program, um, or we can kind of dive in to getting some of those specifics nailed down. All right, questions, anyone? Hi, Barry. Rana, it looks like you've got your hand up. Where's she at? Yep, yep, um, go I was, for it. Yeah, my question uh, was specifically just about the pre and the post audit. And um, I know that we're all interested in having that done. I, I, it sounded like that was not necessarily a, a given that that would happen. So is that something that we have to set up or is that something that you assist us to set up pre and post? Right. That's a great question. Um, a lot depends on the infrastructure um, and, and, and how we go about doing it. A lot of times for the smaller communities, um, like yourselves, it's it's not cost effective to do to you know hire the consultant to do a full blown waste audit because uh, typically those run about fifteen to twenty thousand per. So if we're looking at one before one after, that's a I mean that's a big chunk of change for some of the smaller programs. If we can't consolidate them, and so yours is one of those that we can't really consolidate with any of the other ones. It's happening at kind of a standalone facility. Um, so we've we've kind of started talking about that, about which programs we're, um, we're gonna pay to have a consultant come in and do the audit. Um, we've got opportunities and ways to do audits without bringing in a consultant, um, you know, so that is definitely something, um, you know, that we can help with. Um, so that's kind of part of this discussion as well, is, you know, what your, what your desires are, what your capabilities are. It sounds, I mean, you've got a big organization here, you know, your, your committee that you've got everybody pulled together. You know, if, if your, if your facility is amenable to having people come in and do a waste audit, we can give you all of the, like, we can give you all the training. We can do all that. We can, we can give you all of the, you know, the, the technology that you need in order to do it. And then you would do it yourself, you know, and then with kind of with our guidance, if that's something you all are open to, absolutely. We can roll that into the program and we can definitely get some good data out of it. So um, so that's kind of like something that, you know, if if you haven't talked about it already, you know, we can kind of start talking about it today um, or we can kind of give you what the framework would look like and then you guys can have an internal discussion, discussion and figure out whether or not that's possible. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of part of it. So we wouldn't, for your specific community, we wouldn't be able to send a consultant up. Like that, I know just from our budget. Um, we've got a lot of big ones that are already happening that are already um, nailed down, you know, that we can't, uh, that we can't move. So some of these, some of our budget, the majority of our budgets already allocated. Um, other questions along that line, or do we kind of want to dump, jump in there or what's the, what's the thought? You're in charge. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Have you had, so you've got, let me pull up my spreadsheet here. Um, so I've got Republic Services mm -hmm. as the hauler and then mm -hmm. West Shore Recycle Center as the MRF. Is mm -hmm. that accurate? Yeah. Okay. And that's accurate for all three communities? Uh, it's definitely for the city of Saugatuck and the city of Douglas. Um, and the township is our little outlier out there because it has its own um, how do you describe it, Daniel? Um, it's not, doesn't have a single hall or contract. Uh, so uh, residents can choose of their own volition who they want to pick up their recycling. Right. But Republic is generally the only game in town for recycling. So if someone's doing recycling, that's who they're going to be doing it with. Right, Daniel? That's, that's pretty accurate. There is one other hauler, Aero Waste. Um, but um, I think the vast majority of, of um, residents in the township use um, Republic and um, most of the like developments or the, the associations, housing and condo associations have a single hauler contract with Republic. Okay. okay. Yeah. So in that situation, it makes it, um, you know, figuring out a way to kind of sample and, and to conduct an audit on your own um, mm -hmm. with our guidance makes it a lot easier. If you've got, you know, one hauler or the majority of the communities, the majority of the residents go to that one hauler and then that hauler takes it to one facility. 
Um, you know, we've done programs where they've got six different haulers and they're going to three different facilities and trying to like get all of it into one spot. So it's easy to sample and easy to, to track. It makes things a little bit more complicated. Um, but, um, but yeah, that sounds like, that sounds like a reasonable option. Um, have you had conversations with West Shore um, in terms of, are they amenable to having people come in and do an audit or are they amenable to doing an audit on their own with a little bit of, you know, instructions and details from us? Like, have you had that conversation? Yeah, so that, that West Shore is actually Republic. Republic is, okay. that's, that's the MRF. Um, so that's- Is it a MRF or is it a transfer station? Uh, as far as I know, it's a MRF. Okay. Yeah. That and so we've worked with Jack Brown with Republic Services. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping he would join us today, but we're we're all having trouble connecting with Jack. So <laughs> so I will follow up okay. with Jack. But at the time when we applied for this, he was more than amenable to it. Okay. So um, I would be surprised if that has changed for some bizarre reason. So okay. for right now, that's the approach I'm taking. Okay, so that can be a follow up conversation that we have with Jack as well. Um, the Republic facilities that we've worked in, they don't specifically have a an existing internal protocol um, for doing an audit. Um, some do. I mean, they might, but that's a question that we can ask. Um, a lot of the waste management facilities have a, an audit that they already do, and they can what they call a customer service audit, and it's a little bit trimmed back but it's still, you know, usable data uh, from our standpoint. Um, so unfortunately, the Republicans don't, the Republicans don't typically have that, um, but we can definitely have that conversation with them and see um, whether or not they're willing to do something, you know, a customer service type audit, or whether or not we can figure out a way to get you all kind of coordinated to do that. Um, and then we can definitely give you all the training and all the resources that, um, that you would need to do that. Okay. So several of our communities have done it on their own. Um, it's kind of, you know, four hours out of your day, you know, before and after the program. Um, and just kind of pulling some samples and making sure that we have um, some data to put into the system to kind of measure okay. that contamination. Looks so. like Kelly has a question. Yeah, so yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but I wanna ask since we've got our expert here. So one of the things that I heard on a prior call is that when Republic picks us up, picks up our recycling, since we're such a small community, then they travel to other communities. Mm. So the audit issue, it becomes more of an issue because it's not really representative of what is happening in our community and, and our work. So how, have, how has that come up in other projects of yours, Cassandra? And how do we ensure that we really are getting the data that we want that's you know, our community? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, because of your collection cycle, the way that it is, that does happen, you know, and with material getting consolidated into the truck. Mm -hmm. So if Republic is willing to work with us on this type of audit, then it's a question of can we can the truck go and collect all of your material and then go back to the facility and dump it? And, and leave it there, you know, and then go back out and do whatever normal routes they, the rest of it is. And then you have the ability to essentially sample, pull samples from your material before it gets consolidated into the rest of the facility. So that's kind of part of that discussion with Republic is kind of where, how, how far they're willing to, or where they're willing to meet us essentially to do it. If your material is consolidated with a lot of other communities or a lot of, you know, commercial properties or whatever it is that they're running, you know, the rest of the day on those routes and they're, and they don't have the ability to pull it apart. Um, it makes an audit not really that applicable in that mm -hmm. situation. So, so that's kind of that we need to have an introductory conversation with the public and see whether or not this can be part of it for, you know, all those logistics, all those operational details. Um, because if if they can't separate your material, then an audit doesn't make sense. Okay, and and just so I I make myself clear, that's not a deal break for us, right? We can still do that feet on the street part yep. of it. Got it. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. It would be wonderful if we could do it, but it won't be a deal breaker. Absolutely. Yeah. Not okay. all of our programs um, do audits. Um, we love to have audit data just because then we've got, you know, before the program, your contamination rate was this number after the program, it was this number. And it's a very clear, you know, linear connection between the two. Um, but it's, it's not a deal breaker. No. Okay. Got it. Okay. Patrick, you have a question. Oh, you're oh, muted. You're muted, bud. Sorry. Uh, would you discuss a little bit the feet on the street, actually what happens with that? Yeah. What activities are done? Absolutely. 
So the feet on the street is um, is what we call essentially the behavior change, the direct engagement with the resident behavior change program. Um, so it includes the info card that we send out that I that I mentioned, and then the tagging program, and then the top issue mailer at the end. Those are kind of like the three sections. But when we're actually out, you know, feet on the street, you know, the the taggers are going out into the community. They're um, flipping the lids on the bins or looking into, you know. Um, tote bins if, if you have the smaller containers, looking and seeing for contamination um, and then tagging um, if contamination is found. Um, part of the conversation is, um, you know, what are we tagging for? And again, that's part of this conversation is, you know, what, what are the biggest issues? What are the things we would consider no's on our info card? And then those same no's, those six no's that we put on our info card are also the ones that we tag for. Um, when the can, when the residents go out or when the taggers go out into the community, how you handle that um, that tagging process, this it's part of this discussion. You know, figuring out how that works. Um, you know, typically, you know, again, a community your size with your collection schedule the way that it is, um, we're not going to bring in a consultant. We're not going to recommend that um, that you hire um, a company to do this. You know, this is probably going to be either you know your community group does it, or you have like one seasonal person or something like that goes out and does it. But again, kind of like that's part of the, what this discussion is today, um, in terms of how many taggers you need, what that's going to look like. Um, you know, we help set up. You know, that we've got an app that you use that, that the taggers use when they're out in the field. Um, that's got all your address lists loaded into the app, along with like a map. And you go along and, you know, you're at the address, you click on the dot on the map on the tag, um, you know, or on the app and, um, you know, whether or not the containers out, if the containers out, if there's the material clean, um, you know, if you put all that information into the app, and then, you know, if the material is not clean, you know, what contaminants did you find? What did you do? Did you leave a tag? You know, did you, did you, was it just a warning tag? Was it a rejection tag? Like how all those different details that we talk about that we build into this program. Um, and then they, you know, verify all those things, put all that information into the app and then kind of, you know, move to the next house. And so all of that information, you know, house by house across your, all three of your communities um, is recorded into the app. And then the next time they come around, that second collection cycle, they come around, they pull up that address, that, that dot on the map, and it's going to have all that previous history loaded into the app. So again, like all this data is collected in the app. Um, you all have access to, you know, the, to the dashboard. You're going to have access to the dashboard where all of this information is going to be stored. And then essentially that allows you to start to look at specific details of your community. It allows you to look at, um, you know, how many people are participating. So you can get a specific address list of all the houses that aren't participating in your recycling program. Um, you can get a specific address list of all the houses that are contaminating every time they put the card out. Um, you know, so you can message to them directly. Like you, it's able. It allows you to kind of break all that data down into individual specific um, address lists or contacts lists, where then you can target your messaging very specifically. Um, so that's kind of what the what is all gathered during the collection process, like during the tagging process. Um, and then kind of once the program's over, we do some of those measurement, we gather some of those measurement metrics. Um, we look at, you know, what your set out rate is, what your participation rate is, which are different. Um, those are different numbers, which are, you know, what your tagging rate was, how many contaminants were in there, um, you know, what the biggest contaminant was. Um, you know, the household, how many households aren't participating, you know, and like, why aren't they participating? You know, what's going on? How can we get those, that participation number up? So, so we break all that data apart um, and then we kind of review the program, but with the ultimate goals of increasing participation, increasing tonnage and increasing quality, like that's kind of what the point of the program is. So, so when we say feet on the street, like it encaps, you know, encapsulates all of that like the, the whole process, um, not just the actual like tagging in the middle. Um, but again, that's kind of what we're here for from a program management standpoint is to kind of help you with all those, the details that lead up to all these specific things. Okay, I got uh, Barry hit his hand up and then Patrick, yeah. and then I have a question, so. Sure. Okay. Go for oh, it, Barry. Thank you, Barnett. Um, is it ever happening? I mean, people may consider that an invasion of privacy. I mean, do you ever get any people stepping out with their garden hose and hosing down the people <laughs> with their garbage bin? Or um, 
Um, we've never gotten gar garden hoses turned on us, no. Um, but you're right. I mean, occasionally some people some people will come out of the house and wonder what you're doing. Um, we always that's the reason we always educate in advance of this program happening. You know, we send out a press release. We make sure that the residents know that it's happening. They've got the info card and typically the info card also has a bit of information about like taggers are gonna be coming by to make sure that you're recycling properly. If you have questions, call this number um, or talk to the taggers, you know, when they're out there as well. Like there's people that will get engaged and will ask questions. Um, we also always make sure that like the police office or the local sheriff's office is informed of this program going on because typically it's happening in the morning um, before the collection trucks come by. Um, so we wanna make sure people are going, walking down the street before the lights are up, before the sun's up, you know, and it's a little dark and people are looking in your bins or digging through your bins. Like, um, you know, we wanna make sure that everybody knows what's happening. Um, there are gonna be people that are upset about it. Yes, that happens. Um, there's always a few that get real upset about it. Um, what we typically say is this is a voluntary program um, as is recycling. If you don't want people to look in your bin, don't put your card out during the program. Just leave your card at home, like leave it, leave, leave it up against the house. But that means they're not gonna be able to participate in the recycling program, you know, over the course of that project as well. Um, but that's typically enough to let people know that it's like, it is voluntary. I mean, they're not gonna get fined. They're not gonna get, you know, arrested. We're just making sure that everything is operating the way that it's supposed to. Um, technically, if you want to get into, you know, brass tax, it's, it's public property. It's in the public domain once it's at the curb. So it's not technically private property. It's not an invasion of privacy, but that's usually not enough of an answer to, <laughs> to make people less upset about it. Um, so we typically say it's completely voluntary. If they don't want to be um, observed or inspected, um, just don't put the card out. Okay. All right. I see yes. Patrick. You're muted, bud. There you go. Um, while while I'm dumpster diving, is there a is there a practical way? Because one of the problems we have is we're limited on the kinds of plastics. Uh, is there a practical way uh, to determine um, uh, the grade of plastic? For instance, we can do ones and twos. Um, yeah. We've got a whole host of other things that I'm sure are in there. Um, how do we handle that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that we go through a lot of training. Um, and by by we, I mean you all. Like we put you through a lot of training. Anybody who's going to be doing the tagging will go through a training program. Um, we've got usually it's an hour, you know, where we talk about like what is recycling, what is contamination, what does it look like? You know, um, what would you do if you saw a bin that looked like this? And we show pictures and then we talk about it. Like, would you tag it? You know, would you, you know, how how do you handle it? So um the main thing to, to realize is that this, there is no digging. And I think I said that too, in terms of like, when we're digging through your recycling bin, we're, there's not. Um, really, it's a very quick process because typically the taggers are, we usually say they need to hit about a hundred houses an hour. You know, so it's a very quick process. It's flip, if it's a cart, they're flipping the lid, they're looking at what's on top and they're assessing it based on that. It has nothing to do with at the bottom of the bin. There could be a bowling ball or a propane tank at the bottom of the bin. We're not going to see that. It's just not going to happen. They're not digging because we don't want them to come across needles or anything else that might be down in there. That's not the point of the program. The point is visual assessment, very quick, tag it, don't tag it, record it in the app, move to the next house. Um, so it's a very quick process. It's not going to catch everybody. Um, it catches the majority of the people. Um, so typically, uh, you know, over the four collection cycles, the majority of the people who need to change their behavior um, are going to get tagged at some point. So, but again, yes, there's training that goes through all of that, um, that talks about, you know, what are we looking for? What's a yes? What's a no? Um, how to handle it, how to move along the process. So we'll definitely get into that um, once we get kind of further along into the program and we start to prepare for actually getting out into the street. Okay. Uh, I had a couple questions. So uh, yeah. press release, you've mentioned that what kind of one of the things we've been really good about, we have great relationship with our local paper. Mm -hmm. um, so we have um, articles that have been thanks to Rana and Daniel been showing up every two weeks in the paper. Um, and so uh, I'm quite intrigued with a press release. I think I asked early on about this, 
Um, and you know better than I do the timing of something like this, but you know, we'd love to get the good word out that we've gotten this and maybe begin to give folks a head up. And I think you guys will provide us some direction on that, right? Absolutely. So we've got, um, we're in the process of drafting a press release right now that's um, essentially talking about all the grantees for phase two. Um, you are welcome once this is drafted, like we'll release it and we'll push it out there, but you're also welcome to give it to your local newspaper. And, you know, and, and that would be, you'd be a portion of that bigger press release. Um, but we also have templates that are specific that we can tailor and be specific to each grantee as they come along. So we can provide you with that template. Um, and it's got all the information about what the Feed on the Street program is, what we're going to be looking for, you know, um, when it's going to happen. And so we definitely draft all of that up and send that out. Um, timing wise, um, typically the press release goes out. Typically, the press release goes out within like the week or two before tagging starts, um, just so that it's fresh in people's minds. Um, the info card is usually landing in mailboxes about that same time. Um, it's usually, again, like a couple of weeks before the tagging starts. Um, but we can also, we've also got temp templates that can be used for after the program is over. You know, that um, what our behavior change was, like what our contamination rate went down to and kind of how to, how to tell that story and how to tell that message after the program is over as well. Um, so yeah, we've got templates for all of those. Um, we're happy to provide and walk you through and kind of, um, you know, draft all of those for you um, as part of this program. But, um, but yeah, the, I want to say the phase two grantee press release, it's scheduled, I, we, I just talked about it yesterday with our comms team. Um, I want to say it's scheduled to go out the first week in March is tentative right now. So first, second week in March, somewhere right around there, because um, we're also going to be dropping a, a new toolkit. Um, so that's going to go, the press for that's going to go out first. And then the phase two grants are gonna um, are gonna roll out. The press release is gonna roll out. Okay. My next question, then I see Demetri and Daniel. Um, these are random audits, right? We're not we're not auditing every single recycling bin in our community. Mm, nope. Every we single are. recycling bin. Yep. All right. That's good to know. Okay. So All good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that kind of brings me to the question. Like, I if I if I wrote it down correctly, you you all get collected. Is it one Monday a month? Is it like every four weeks? Every is that four right? Weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And is every are all three of your communities picked up on that same Monday, or is it different? It, it, it might be. It's different because Township gets actually serviced twice a month, and okay. the pickup is on a Tuesday. I but okay. oh, wait, wait, it. I have to double check that if it's a Tuesday for recycling. Know. Yeah, but we do get serviced twice a month in the Township. Okay. Okay. From All Republic? Right. From Republic, yes. Okay. And then Douglas and Sog and the city are one Monday a month? Yeah, yeah. I think ours is, is a right? Monday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then so, my next, go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to say that's, yeah, the goal for the program is, again, that's why it's a very quick process, that there's not a lot of, you know, digging or time spent at each house, is that ideally it's every house. Um, every collection um, for for four collection cycles. So okay. in that situation, if the townships collected twice a month, um, then you know their process essentially would be two months long. Whereas you know the the other two, um, if you're only collected once a month or every four weeks, essentially yours would be a four month long process before we okay. get through the entire um, the entire program. So. Um, and not to say that's not a deal breaker, you know, and, and we can adjust it, you know, but we know that adjusting it reduces the impact of the results. Um, and so, you know, ideally, we'd like to keep that schedule if, it, if it's possible. Um, okay. So and so and we can talk a little bit about, about how that would look and what that would look like. All right. And then my last question, you've mentioned trainings. When mm -hmm. do those happen? When do those start? Yeah. So um, starting with this meeting. Um, Amina most likely will get um, an, an email sent out to you all um, to get like every other week meetings put on the calendar um, starting probably within the next couple of weeks. And so it'll be kind of like a check-in meeting, but as, we'll, as we start to develop the timeline and we'll start to talk about individual pieces as we, as we go. Um, and so those meetings will start pretty soon. 
um, you know, again, if we are looking at a, at least four months of tagging, then we've got to do some stuff before the tagging starts, obviously. And then you've got the tagging and then you've got some stuff after the tagging. So, so that's going to be, that's going to extend your program timeline. Um, so we'll, we'll get those meetings um, scheduled here pretty soon. Okay. And then we'll start essentially drafting agenda for each one of those meetings. You know, the first couple of meetings are probably going to be talking about timeline and collateral, you know, address lists and, you know, those types of details that we need to start gathering and figuring out, getting all those um, boxes checked off um, to start getting into the details of the program. Okay. And just so, so everybody, everybody here knows we have all year. So it's not like yes. we have six months. No, we have nope. all year. So. Yep. You've got all year and technically your grant contract, I think goes through like March of next year. Um, and if we need to make an amendment on that to include time to do, you know, like the final reports and stuff like that, which we usually give you a couple of months after the program is over to do that. If we need to extend that timeline, we can. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, but trainings, like whenever the trainings need to happen, they'll fall within that schedule. So, um, you know, the training for your taggers will happen probably the week before tagging starts, you know, so, in, so it, it, cause a lot of that, like, there's a lot of other things that need to be done before we can do that training. Like we need to get all of your address lists into the tagging app, you know? And so that way, when we do the tagging training, everybody's got the app, you know, and they can actually like get in it and do it during the training. So, so there's a lot of those types of details that, um, that we just have to make sure that everything gets coordinated. So it's, they were going to fall within the program. It's like running a campaign for office. Okay, Demetri, <laughs> I see your hand up. Yeah, Cassandra, I was wondering if um, the flyers, the information uh, cards that go out to the households, um, does it sort of include the point of view that the recycling cans are uh, little um, cans of revenue or wealth or resources um, that get put back into the cycle? Um, that's usually, that type of language is usually included in the press release. Um, the info card is going to be a little bit more general than that. It's going to be, um, you know, it's going to be, these are the yeses and like five, you know, icon sets essentially of what can go in, you know, paper, cardboard, plastic, you know, I mean, aluminum, metals, it's going to be real big picture. And then there's going to be like five or six, no icons. It's like no plastic bags no bagged recycling, no trash. Like it's very, very brief, very, sure. very quick. And then on the back side, on the mailing panel, you're going to have a little bit of text that talks about like taggers are coming during this time, you know, to, to look and make sure that we're all recycling correctly. For more, for more information, go to this website, call this phone number. It's going to be real, real brief. It's not going to get into the details about um, why we're doing it, like the circular economy and, and getting everything back into the revenue stream, that's going to be left for the press release where you've got a little bit more time to get that information um, out there um, because the info cards are going to be, we want people to be able to like capture the information very quickly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I don't know who was next. Kelly's at the top of my screen. I don't know if that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, Cassandra, will you make a recommendation for the number of taggers that we need in order to successfully implement this? Yep. And then I'm assuming, you know, we need them to dedicate their time for the four cycles and then the training prior, or do we have some of us that go through the full training and then maybe a secondary person that's willing to give their time for just the cycle part to flip the lid and not necessarily be kind of the, the educated one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> We will definitely tell you how many taggers you need um, based on the number of households you have per route um, and um, and when you know they're going to be out there. Um, it doesn't have they don't have to be volunteers. Um, you know there is money in the grant to pay them. So if you if you've got seasonal people or you know high school kids or, or anything like that that you could, that are willing to do that. Um, sometimes it's a little bit easier to get people to guarantee they're going to be there for four collection cycles in a row. Um, again, with yours only being one day, that's not a huge ask. Um, so again, you can kind of depend on figure, we can kind of figure out how that goes, but, but yeah, we'll tell you how many taggers you need and what time period in order to get them out there. Cause they've got to go essentially before the trucks. So we've got to talk to Republic about when the trucks, you know, go out every day on that particular route. Um, and so 
kind of walk you through that. Um, rough ballpark, you know, typically attacker can go, we, a lot of times we'll send them out in pairs. We'll send them out in teams because again, safety, you know, um, um, but typically it's a hundred houses per hour. Um, so depending on how many households are on that particular route, you know, so if you've got what about 2,300 households total, but that's divided up amongst the three communities, then, you know, that's going to vary essentially how many people we need per, per route. But yeah, we'll get into all that. We've, we, we do all that for you. Um, you know, once we have like the address list and the route schedule, like we'll figure out kind of what we need. And then in terms of the training, we recommend that anybody who's going to be out there is on the training, you know, cause that way everybody's walking through the app um, that's going to be using it. You know, there's going to be one person who we'd consider, you know, an on the ground project manager, you know, if it's Garnett or if it's one of you all who's going to be like out in the field with them um, to answer questions. It's like, well, my app stopped working. What do I do? You know, I mean, like that type of information, type of question. But anybody who's going to be tagging should be on the training. Yep. So and again, there's money in the grant to pay for the taggers, you know, for um. I don't remember what exactly how much we allocated. I think it was like 13 or $16 an hour. I mean, it's a pretty mm -hmm. decent salary yeah. for however many hours we need um, in order to do it. Got it. All right, Daniel. Um, I guess mine's kind of like a, a technical question that we'd, we'd get to, but um, is there a strategy for, for dealing with rural communities? Because for, for I'm thinking specifically on the, the, you know, the feed on the street program, mm -hmm. um, because in the township, households can be quite far from one another. Um, and then we have a section of town that's, you know, like residential suburbs you'd see outside of Chicago. Yeah. So I just wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's typically something we start to get a little bit more detailed into before we start tagging. Um, for areas that are really low density, um, like you said, like really rural, there's a lot of space. Um, typically they're driving those routes. Um, and that's all, again, one of the reasons we have a team going out instead of just an individual person is that you've got one person driving and one person getting out and, you know, flipping the lid. So one person might be driving and doing the app. So they pull up to the house. One person hops out, goes, this one's good, you know, and then the other person's logging it in the app um, and then kind of moving to the next house. They hop back in, they drive to the next house. So, um, and then if there's areas where it's really close together and, and the houses are all really close together, you know, they can park the car and then you've got people going down, you know, one person on either side of the street, you know, working their way down the street or you go down and you come back to the car and then move it. So, so there's a lot of different ways to kind of feel out. Um, that's part of, um, of your part of kind of these meetings is you know your communities better you know which areas um you know need to be driven and which areas um you know can be walked and and that kind of thing i mean obviously you're the ones that are going to be there and wake up and there's you know three feet of snow on the ground and you're like well we're certainly not walking today you know i mean so you're the ones that are kind of like being that part, you know, that local perspective of the program, um, because I don't know all those specific details, you know, because I'm not there. But yeah, we do have plans in place and we know how to handle like rural communities versus really like high, um, high density, you know, urban areas. All right, Thank Rana. You. Yeah. Um, I've got two quick questions. One of them is uh, short term rentals are abundant in the summer here. Mm -hmm. And so that I would consider that to be kind of transient participation on behalf of the people who are, if they do put the recycle bin out, maybe it's uneducated, um, maybe it's, it's just not consistent. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, um, that's my first question, is how do you handle that? Absolutely. So typically, you know, in an ideal world, we would avoid the season where that would occur. You know, because what you what we're targeting with this program is really long term behavior change. So if you've got a portion of the population that is seasonal and or like you said, short term rentals because they're vacations or tourists, you know, ideally, we would avoid that time of year and we'd avoid those houses. Mm -hmm. um, with your program being such an extended period of time, you know, with it being only one collection, you know, a month, um, it's, it's hard to avoid those types of months because otherwise we might have a big gap in the middle of our program. Um, Cause if we go 
real early, you know, it's still real cold, you know, we can't get this program launched, you know, much earlier than like April. Um, and then you've only got a couple of months before you hit the summer. And then you've got more time at the end, but then you hit holidays. And so it's like, we can't really break it in this in the middle, like we would, you know, on, on, on another program. Um, so there's some of those things that we want to, we'll start talking about as we start talking about, um, you know, collateral. Um, when I say collateral, I mean like the, the printed materials, like the info card and whatnot. You know, do we want to, if the short-term rentals and the tourists or the seasonal populations are real big part of your community, do we want to make that info card into a magnet? So the magnet goes on the fridge so that every, no matter who's in that house, knows how to handle and how, knows how to Im, like, um, part, take part of in the program? Like, is that how we want to handle it? Or do we feel like it's a small portion of the population and it's not really going to impact your results all that much? And then we'll just carry on, you know, as business as normal. So again, part of that conversation of kind of like how we want to handle it, how we want to shape the program, we've got the ability to kind of make sure that it makes sense for your community. Um, so that's something to think about, you know, do you think it's a big portion of the population? Um, do you feel like since it's only one collection a month that a lot of times, you know, they're local, local landlords, maybe that are renting these houses out, people own multiple properties and, and then they come over and grab the recycling and put it out the curb on the one day a month where it's applicable. And then in that situation, you're still getting the information to the people that it needs to be. So, you know, like having these conversations and figuring out kind of how to, how to create the program so that it's effective. That's kind of what we're looking for. Okay, my uh, second question was um, in Douglas, we are in the process of uh, starting to talk about our renegotiation of our contract with Republic. Mm -hmm. And we are hoping, hoping that we're gonna end up with um, twice a month pickup. Mm. And so in that case, I know Sagatuck is interested in doing the same thing. And I don't know if they're gonna end up opening up their contract shortly after ours is up. So that's where that is, um, where that conversation is starting. Um, okay. Kathy, you would know better on the exact timing of that, but I was wondering. Mid November. Uh, Mid -November. Oh, November. Oh, okay. Oh, that's later than I thought, but there has been discussion about having that, having um, renegotiating prior to that. So I guess the question would be if, in, from my perspective, it seems like it'd be better to wait if that is in fact probably going to happen because it shortens the cycle on, on our end. So from once a month to then it's like two months worth of. The four weeks. So I just wondered what your perspective is. Do you feel like it's better to wait on that until that part is negotiated or not? Um, you know, if we wait, then you're looking at implementing this next year. Um, you know, so I mean, that would, that would push you. I mean, not to say that we couldn't do, you know, move you all to phase three, since we've got a phase three that's already been granted to us. We know that's happening. Um, you know, we've got the freedom to do that if you want to wait and see. Um, or you can, if it's not, if contract negotiations aren't going to start until November, um, you know, then we can do this program. And then you've got data to take to Republic and say, this is what's happening in the community. This is a reason why um, we should move to, you know, twice a month recycling because we've got, you know, an 85% participation rate and people, you know, containers are always overflowing, you know, so, so we can track some of that stuff in the app. We can get you some of that data um, okay. that they might not have that might be useful for a contract negotiation, you know, so, yeah, and I would, so I'm however sorry, you guys want to handle it, what do you think? Yeah, I would say right now we uh, we move forward as if things are the way they are. Uh, you know, contracts like this will take a while. I don't want it to hold us up. The city of Saugatuck won't even get there till next year. So, um, in my opinion, we just move ahead. And it, if it comes about to be in Douglas in November, my plan is, my hope would be, like Sandra's saying, you've got data that's mm -hmm. showing, especially with our short-term rentals. I mean, we all know it goes crazy in July and August, and that's just you know just from our rentals alone, we need, <laughs> there's always uh, a need for more pickup and we'll just have the data for it. So yep. Kathy, your hand is up. Yeah, you mentioned that you had um, uh, generated a list of addresses that you pick up at. Does that come from Republic or is that something that the municipalities provide? Where does that list come from? And then second to that, well, Two parts to that. Can you then identify of that list of addresses that have trash pickup, um, how many of them don't participate in recycling? Because that is voluntary. 
I mean, you have mm -hmm. to call and get your bin, right? Yep. And then third, is there a way to pull out those addresses and identify those that are short-term rental to target them specifically in the audit? Okay. Um, so the address list, that's a great question um, as to where the address list comes from. So the address list is typically not something that we generate. That's something that you all generate um, and then give to us. We put into the tagging software and then through the tagging program, that address list, then we can start to pull apart into what you're asking for. So, um, so from that standpoint, yes, I would encourage, um, I would encourage you to, well, typically you can get the address list from two different places. You can get it from the hauler um, or you can get it from like, like, like the assessor's office, you know, or like, but what we're looking for is essentially we're looking for single family residences, you know, so we're looking for single family or what's considered single family and, and including like condos and duplexes, anything that would have, you know, individual service um, by your hauler. So if Republic handles all of that, then they can get you an address list. But it sounds like you've got at least one other hauler that handles it. Um, so you would need address lists from both um, in order to have a complete, what we would consider a complete address list, because ideally your address list that we upload into the tagging system is not just the houses that currently have recycling, but it's every house. Mm -hmm. And then we, through the tagging process, they can mark the ones that aren't participating in the program. And then that gives you the list of the, of the houses that aren't currently can, you know, opting in to the recycling program and allows you to kind of target them and message to them to direct directly. So, so that's something that you all need to start working on um, is, is getting essentially an address list pulled together. Um, and so if it's talking to, you know, your public assessor's office, or if it's talking to your two haulers, you know, and then essentially combining those um, address lists together. Um, but we do need, and I can give you a, a template essentially for the address list, but essentially what we need is we need the address and we need um, the, the day of collection. So, um, so that would be essentially, it would vary depending on your community. So that's probably kind of like what we would consider in the system or in the template, like three different routes. You'd have the route for Saugatuck, the, so the route for the township, and then the route for Douglas, you okay. know, and that's kind of how we would look at the addresses. That's how they'd go up into the system. All right, I'll get on that. That's, okay. Okay. Very good. Barry, your hands up. Thank you, Garnett. Uh, this is obviously focusing on the feet on the street approach, which probably is where we're going to go. But there was still the start of the conversation was working with Republic, and let's say that we can work out the thing where they don't commingle other uh, communities. How does that work? This, and I think about the Ken Freestone uh, video where. They dumped everything in a parking lot and the students went through with a stick and kind of, you know, said, well, that's what's in there. So how does that work? And that would sound like if it works that way, that's a much deeper dive than just looking at the top contents, a hundred houses an hour. Yeah. Um, we found that the best behavior change comes from both, essentially using both methods and layering them together. So typically what we recommend is if you can do an audit, like you were talking about, like the video where you collect all the material just from your communities and it gets dumped, you know, at the recycling facility, but in a separate section, um, you know, and we give you essentially the training and the protocols that you would like how to pull samples out of it you know, how big of the samples need to be. And then you would go through it and sort them based on what's all in there, what's good recycling, what's not, you know, in kind of the different categories. And again, this is all information and training we would give you. Um, and then you'd weigh all those different samples and they'd go into um, a, a program, a digital program that we use that essentially assesses all of that. And it kind of gives you a contamination rate based on the data that you put into it. And then taking that number and saying, okay, we did an audit. And as a community, as a tri-community, our contamination rate is X percentage. And then you do the behavior change program. Then you do the feed on the street program where you're tagging the individual communities. And the part that that adds is the direct resident engagement. So you're saying directly to the person who lives in that house, you put something in your bin that's not allowed. This is what it was. Don't do it again, because it's not recyclable. 
and giving them that feedback directly to them that they can't pawn it off on anybody else. They can't say, well, that wasn't me. That was my neighbor. I recycle perfectly. It was like, oh, or that, that wasn't us. That wasn't our community. That was the tourists. The tourists did that. Like they can't put it off on anybody else. They got a tag because it came out of their cart. And then at the end, after we've had those engagements with the residences, you know, three collection cycles, four collection cycles in a row, then at the end, we do another one of those audits where we take all samples from the entire community and we say, based on the behavior change that we worked on through the tagging program, we lowered our contamination rate to this percentage. And so, and that's the whole program. And that's what we know. We've implemented this in hundreds of communities across the United States. And we know that all of those pieces are important to creating that long-term behavior change. Daniel? There you go, Daniel. A uh, quick thing, because I know we're running out of time, but mm -hmm. I wonder if you could touch on the, the wrap-up section, because I'm just thinking that, you know, how do we, once we get all this data, how do we really leverage that um, especially because each community has, I think, different goals. I think the cities want to move to um, um, two, monthly, uh, two monthly pickups. Were the townships interested in moving towards single hauler? Because we think that's kind of our best bet in increasing the participation rate in recycling. So I wonder if you could just kind of speak to how you've seen other communities leverage that data um, after the program has been completed. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, we always do kind of a, a wrap up at the end of the project where we go through that and we look at that and we analyze it, you know, and we're looking at that throughout the program. We're looking for outliers, you know, of, of the data when it starts to, when those starts, those graphs start to build and we start to look at how, you know, the, the different information that's coming in from each of the communities or each of the routes in your situation. Um, and we start to analyze it and say, okay, what are we looking at? What are we looking for? And we're looking for those outliers, those weird things and kind of what that tells us. You know, does, does it show us that, you know, your participation rate is so high that you really are looking for an increase in collection frequency? Um, or is your participation rate so low that you need more than an opt-in program? Like you need a way, you know, to guarantee that everybody has access to it, you know, that there's not a hurdle that they have to go through. So we really do go through that process kind of at the end with you all. Like we look at it from our perspective of knowing kind of what the trends are supposed to look like. And we'll walk you through that um, and say, you know, based on your data that we're seeing, these are the things that we can pull out and say, this is kind of like your next steps. Um, and absolutely, like the data is going to be able to show you, you know, is your participation rate high enough or your tonnage rate high enough or a combination of the two to show you really do need to move to every other week, um, you know, or twice a week, twice a month collection, you know, um, you know, is your participation rate so low you need to opt in or you need to increase the container size or whatever it is, you know, that we're looking at. Um, every program is a little bit different. So we never go into it saying these are the data points we want to get out of it because we don't want to skew um, how we look at it, you know? And so, and every program surprises us. Um, you know, we, Bangor Township was one that went last year and they were like, oh no, we have great participation, you know, not really a lot of, you know, contamination. And then when we started tagging, like their set out rate was like 18%. It was real low. It was a heck of a lot lower than any of them expected it to be. And so that was kind of like, okay, you need to move away from the opt-in program and move to, towards a universal collection. And now that's what they're working on. You know, they're working with waste management to adjust their contract and to get a cart grant so they can put carts, you know, at the curb instead of tote bins um, that people have to pick up from City Hall. So, so there's a lot of those things that we look at. Um, and that's part of it. That's part of the technical assistance that we provide um, throughout the grant, but then definitely at the end when we start to look and analyze that data. And we can pull it apart. So how we upload your address lists into the system, um, like I said, they'll be, we'll code them by route. So each one of your communities will essentially be its own route in the address list so that we then can look at each route individually. Um, some of the data is going to be compiled together, but we'll be able to pull out each route and look at it individually. So from that perspective, you'll have community specific information. Um, ideally, we'd be able to sample that way as well um, with the audit, but that's a conversation we need to have with the Republic. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, I know we're at time. I've yeah. got a little bit of wiggle room. I don't know about you all. Um, I don't have another meeting in, uh, until half past. 
Um, but I can follow up as well. I'll follow up um, with an email about kind of like some of the specifics that we need to start rolling. Perfect. I've got a meeting scheduled for tomorrow for me to brief Amina. Okay. Um, and then, like I said, you're going to hear from her and she'll set up kind of those every other week check-in calls moving forward. Okay. Um, because of like the way that they fall, it probably won't be like your entire committee is going to be mm -hmm. on each call because she's going to need to schedule them on a Monday, sure. Thursday yeah. or Friday. Um, but it's definitely something that we can kind of, you know, figure out how, how the best way to work it is, um, work it into the system and, you know, schedule wise and, and get all those details nailed down. All right. Very good. Yeah, I'll be the main point of contact. Um, okay. I'll be the project manager, for lack of a better description. Um, Patrick raised his hand. Are you raising your hand, bud? <laughs> no. He's going back and forth. Just quickly, um, <laughs> um, segue on, on uh, that. the last question is, have communities been able to use this data when it's all said and done to leverage um, uh, the public to be more aware of source reduction? Yes and no. Um, you know, typically this program gets very clearly gets the information across about what isn't recyclable. Um, and then it's kind of up to the community to take that and to take it to the next level and engage on a deeper level, you know, via social media or press release or kind of however you want to handle it um, to say, you know, all these things that we've figured out aren't recyclable in our curbside stream. These are ways that we can not generate them at all, you know, and kind of and, and to kind of pivot that message um, into a more of a source reduction, you know, uh, reduce, reuse kind of message. Um, but this program is specifically targeting, um, you know, recycling, you know, and so that's, it's not really focused. It's kind of a secondary outcome of the program typically, but not necessarily something we focus on directly. Um, part of it, we encourage you to download the social media toolkits that we have available on our website, um, which are free. Those are like pre pre-created, you know, pictures and messages that you can put out onto social media. They're not specifically about the feed on the street campaign, but they're about kind of recycling and reducing and reusing waste just in general and more like circular economy type messaging. Um, and you're welcome to use those at any point, you know, throughout the program, as well as, um, you know, to kind of, to kind of pivot towards that message, more that message than just the, what isn't, isn't recyclable. Okay. All right, Patrick's got his hand up again, but I don't know if he's doing that on purpose. No, he says no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Other other questions for Cassandra. Um, otherwise, we'll let her scooch so she's actually not running late for another meeting. I appreciate that. Yeah. And thank you. And I, the people I, I'm meeting with in 20 minutes also appreciate that. Yeah. Very very good. And uh, and we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to this and look forward to meeting Amina. Yeah, absolutely. All okay. Right. Well, Thanks. thank you all for having me. Let me know if there's any questions that pop up, but, um, but yeah, I'll follow up and um, Amina and I will follow up by email about some of these other details. All right. Very okay. good. Thank you Thanks. so much. Bye. All right. Very good. All right. Okay, gang. Um, really quickly, just because I know folks have places they need to go, and people to see things to do. Uh, my, my approach on this grant is, uh, and she, she had it on a couple of times, our, our whole goal is really to educate and inform. And what I don't want us as an entity, uh, number one, is to be overwhelmed with, with this. Um, when, you, when you look at, and, and we'll get a lot of this information, but I've got a, a little bit of list uh, to do for myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out to Republic. I got to talk to Jack anyway, because he's been kind of gone for a while. So I need that address list from him because that's the first place to start. And then the next the next place, I'll ask Kathy right away to see if you can get an address list from your assessor, your treasurer and Douglas and Daniel, I'll ask for the same and then I'll do, I'll talk to Peter in the city of Saugatuck. Um, um, and I wasn't kidding when I said this is like setting up a campaign for office because you you literally, we'll put this in an Excel sheet and, and um, be able to um, organize it, I think, pretty effectively. Uh, the other thoughts that I have, since there is money in here to pay, I'd love to play some of the high school kids. Um, and uh, we have, through Rotor, we have, we have the Interact Club, and these folks are, a lot of these students are very connected environmentally. And I'm going to reach out to Mike Shaw 
and see if uh, we might be able to um, hire a couple of kids. Um, this is great experience for them. Um, something they can put on the resume, um, but then I think a way we can lock them into this as well. So I, I feel like we've got some options in addition to just the, the 10 of us who are a part of this organization. Um, but when I did the math, you know, 23 households, 2,300 households divided by 100 per hour, you're looking at 23 hours and now you put, you know, do the math. I, honestly, I think um, if we get enough help either through Rotary or Interact and then ourselves, we're gonna be okay. We're, we're going to be fine. Um, so it feels overwhelming, but um, like she said, literally just lifting up the lid on a recycling bin and looking in um, is, is a pretty manageable thing. So it's the township where I think we'll have to help out because it's uh, in some areas of Douglas. Um, but, uh, you know, for the most part, I think we're going to be able to hit 100 of those bins um, pretty effectively. So that's that's my optimistic garn shining through. <laughs> so. Yeah, quick, quick comment, yeah. Karen. Yeah. So to Michelle Shaw about the Interact Club after yeah. the question. And she was super positive about it. And she said her husband would absolutely want to know about it. She said one of the challenges would be is if this is taking place during summer time. She said it's obviously harder to catch these students because there's not that like day to day touch that he has on them when they're in the school. Yeah. But if per what Cassandra said, if we're going to push this out, you know, I don't know where all your brains went, but if we're going to try and put this like July, August, September, October, so we get a little bit of data from kind of both subsets of how things are tourist and non-tourist timeframe, then we would have the kids back for um, yeah. the second half in school. But if we're paying them, then I think we could stand a good chance. And also I think if, you know, the training starts before that, so we're roping them in before mm -hmm. then with commitment, then I think, you know, we can probably get something going there. Yeah, and if you want to reach out to her again, Kelly, that would be great. That would save me some time. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd, uh, in, a, in a way, from things like this that I've done in the past, generally the Recycling Partnership has a contract. And these young folks that we're going to pay sign this contract. That they'll have to do a W-9. They'll have to do the whole thing. So they will sign a contract committing to this, mm -hmm. um, which is good practice for them for their future life. Uh, so if we can get a handful of of young people to commit, that would be really good. Kathy, I saw your hand. Yeah. Is there any concern about sending high school kids out on their own going door to door, so to speak, uh, as far as the safety yeah. issue? Yeah, and I, th you know, I think uh, once we get the training, you know, we're talking about adults with high school folks, I'd be inclined to um, uh, ask, you know, like I'd have a young person go with me. You'd have a young person go with you. I'm not gonna send them out there on their own. That's what um, I was thinking too. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to do that to yeah. them. It, it, yeah, the, the, and they'll learn from us. With the app and everything. It's like, yeah, hi, Barry. Yeah, uh, yeah. as far as uh, young folks, uh, you, you had mentioned one of the notes about the scouts and it's mm -hmm. a small group of people, there's 14, but one of the things we do have in scouts is we're required to take youth protection training yeah, and sure. uh, the cardinal rule is uh, an adult is never alone with the, with the youth. So if you do partner uh, the young folks up, there's got to be at least two adults mm -hmm. and maybe two youths, uh, but you can't one-on-one -on -one them. Um, yeah, case. so, and that, that reminds me, I, is this something that the scouts might be interested in participating in? Yeah, again, a small pool, but you can't pay them. They do it a good sure. turn daily. They do it for a badge, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's cool. Okay. Yeah, I think that the, um, if we put out a, also a request for volunteers, I think, uh, general community members would would be interested. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, yeah. All right. Very good. Um, okay. I also um, think what Rana was talking about, about the pre and post audits, I think those are important. I think communities would want that type of information. So I, I would be um, willing to participate in something like that. Yeah, let me, uh, Jack, I've got to find the elusive Jack. So. Yeah, find <laughs> find, find Jack. Jack. Yeah, I'm gonna I think find there's Jack. a show, find Jack. Yeah, I'm going to find Jack and see, um, you know, what we can set up. Uh, what's he, when, when we originally applied for this, we wouldn't have been eligible for this in the first place had Republic and the MRF not agreed to participate. So, um, you know, he, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to Jack and see what we can coordinate from an auditing type of thing. Um, and for those of us who want to, you know, jump into the pile of recycling, 
um, we may very well have that opportunity. So, okay. Yeah. I think it's a good experience. So, all right. All right. All set. I will, um, I don't want to inundate you all with emails. I've got a feeling that things are going to probably start um, coming my way. Um, so what I, what I think I'll do, if you don't mind, is I'll continue to coordinate through Rana and Daniel. Um, and uh, I'm thinking we will probably have to connect. If we need to connect before our March meeting, I will let you know. And for those who are uh, available, you can participate. Um, but um, I'll try to not inundate you with emails about this, okay? Um, really quickly before I let you go, uh, household hazardous waste day tentatively scheduled for the Saturday after Earth Day, which I think is like the 24th of April. I've got it here in my notes. Um, Rotary is participating in that, um, is a big sponsor of it. Uh, our biggest challenge right now is going to be finding um, a company to contract with because drug and lab disposal is not available. They are short staffed. So we're going to uh, move on to the next. I'm participating in a household hazardous, way ha household hazardous waste day roundtable discussion tomorrow with folks around the state. So I'll see if they might have some recommendations. Um, but Rana had already found us a place that collects e-waste. So um, I might start with them first and see if they are just willing to be just that recycling, recycling partner. Um, but I'll, I'll let you know on that as well. So that's that tentatively, tentatively in the works. And I think honestly, that's gonna be quite enough for us to do all year. <laughs> between, between this grant and that, I think that is just plenty. And then Patrick, we've got some things um, working that we're working with Patrick on the refillable water stations. Um, and that's kind of beginning in the works as well. So those are three pretty big projects. Um, so stay tuned. What's the date again, Garn? Uh, April the 24th. Let me 23rd is a Saturday. Yeah, 23rd. Yep. Okay. I think that's Earth Day because it's always like on the 22nd or something yeah, like that. That's what I have down. Okay. Yep. So that's tentatively where we're at. Okay. Yep. Great. All right. I appreciate y'all calling in. Um, okay, that's it. I'll leave it at that. Bye, everybody. Bye. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. All right.